Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining the Surrey Board of Trade this afternoon. I'm Anita Huberman. I'm CEO of the Board of Trade, Surrey's city building business organization. I'm also an honorary captain of the Royal Canadian Navy. Today's event is focused on the forestry industry sector in Surrey. And yes, Surrey is a forestry town and we have significant ties with our forestry partners throughout British Columbia and especially in Northern BC. I'd like to acknowledge that we are on the treaty territory of the Tawasin First Nations and the unceded territory of our Coast Salish peoples, specifically the Kwantlen, Capesi and Semiamu First Nations. And I'd also like to acknowledge that we are also on the land of the Inuit and Métis peoples. I just wanted to pause and let you know, ladies and gentlemen, that we reflect today on what has transpired on another tragedy in our history in Saskatchewan. And uh, especially this forthcoming Canada Day, we really need to ensure that we reflect on the past, but move forward together. We need to learn and listen to each other, but we must move forward. And the only way that we can do that this Canada Day is together. Events like this simply do not happen without sponsorship. So thank you so much to our community sponsor, the BC Council of Forest Industries. Our business and international trade center sponsors are the law firm of Faskin, the Chambers of Commerce Group Insurance Plan represented by SNF Benefits, BDC, the Business Development Bank of Canada, and Scotiabank. Thank you so much. I'd also like to recognize some government officials that are with us this afternoon. Trevor Halford, representing the MLA for Surrey White Rock, our Ann Bonner and Effie Cerise. John Rustad, MLA for Nashako Lakes, official opposition for British Columbia, the critic on forest lands and natural resource operations. And City of Surrey Councillor Linda Annis. Just some instructions before we begin. All attendees are muted. If you do have a question, please put it in the chat function of this technology. We also ask media that are on the call to do the same. We will get to your question during the question period after all presenters have spoken. And if we're unable to get to your question, the answer will be sent to you by email after the presentation. So I just wanted to remind you that Surrey is going to be the largest city in British Columbia by 2030. The Surrey Board of Trade, we support business, bring business into the city. We're one of the top 10 largest Chambers of Commerce Boards of Trades in Canada out of 450. That gives us a very unique voice at all government tables. And we are an independent voice of business we advocate to instigate change at the different levels of government, in addition to a variety of services within our portfolio to meet the demands of different industries. The forestry sector is very important, not only from the perspective of creating good quality jobs for families, uh, making sure that uh, we're creating affordable housing solutions, but they are an absolutely important ingredient in global trade. And they put us on the map, this sector, in terms of what Canada, what BC can do, and in terms of innovation, in terms of reflecting uh, greenhouse gas emission reductions. Uh, you're going to hear so much about the forestry sector in Surrey. You're going to hear about the challenges and the opportunities and what we need to do together to ensure the sustainability of this industry, which was very important also during the pandemic. So ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome Alexa Young. She is the Vice President of Government and Public Affairs for the Council of Forest Industries. Alexa, over to you. 
Thanks so much, Anita, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm really happy to be here today joining you virtually from the traditional territory of the Coast Salish people. For those of you who don't know the BC Council of Forest Industries, a very quick 101. We represent the majority of forest product manufacturers from across BC. So that's companies big and small, making everything from lumber to shakes and shingles to paper packaging. And Anita, a big thanks to you and your team for hosting this event. I really don't think it could come at a more interesting time for our sector. And that's for a whole bunch of different reasons. You know, we're hopefully uh, nearing the tail end of the pandemic. And like I'm sure you all are, governments, community leaders, businesses, and people everywhere are thinking about what's the other side gonna look like? What's our economy gonna look like? What sectors are gonna help get more people back to work and businesses back in action? At the same time, we're seeing citizens, investors, customers, again, people everywhere, demanding action on critical issues like climate change. I'd argue that the pandemic has actually ramped up expectations on this. And here's what the good news is, BC's forest sector can help on both fronts. And I really wanna put some context around that because it's super critical as we think about the important dialogue that's happening with respect to forestry in BC today. You know. This is a sector that supports 100,000 good jobs for British Columbians. That's putting $8 billion in wages in people's pockets each year. That's contributing $4 billion in annual revenues to governments. That's helping to pay for things that we all care about, like healthcare, like affordable housing, like mental health supports. It's also a sector that's full of people who care, who take care of the forest, that are proud to produce low carbon products that are a better choice for the planet that are proud to be working in partnerships with indigenous people and who are proud to be innovators. These are people who are forever looking for new ways to do things better, safer, and more sustainably. So why is this important to you as local business leaders, as community leaders, as citizens of Surrey? I don't wanna be presumptuous, uh, but you probably don't consider Surrey a forestry town, not like you would Prince George or Campbell River, that's for sure. But as Anita mentioned a while ago, Half of forestry jobs are in the lower mainland and southwest part of the province. That's a huge number. I'm sure our friend Jack, who's gonna be on the panel later, is gonna tell you about what it means to have his company, Teal Jones, headquartered in Surrey. But it's not just about having forestry companies headquartered right in your backyard. It's the small businesses, the medium-sized businesses across the city that are providing goods and services to the sector too. And I just want to play a, a short video to give you more perspective on that. Hey, British Columbians. What does a forester in Prince George, a drone maker in Vancouver, and an environmental consultant in Victoria all have in common? They're all part of a forestry community. That's because BC's forest industry purchased more than $7 billion in goods and services from nearly 9,900 suppliers located in 340 communities and from 120 Indigenous nations and affiliated organizations in 2019. Suppliers in communities like Vancouver, Prince George, Campbell River, Quinnell, and Surrey, which were the top five locations for forest industry spend. If each supplier employs 5, 10, 50, 100 people, that's a whole lot of British Columbians who count on the forest industry each day to support their families, pay their bills, and enjoy a great quality of life. To find out more about how your community is a forestry community, read our 2019 study, Deep Roots, Strong Communities, at Kofi.org. So let's recap, that's $211 million spent in Surrey in 2019 on 360 suppliers. So that's engineering consultants, they're welders, hydraulic equipment suppliers, machine repair workers. These are all people and businesses who are gonna help BC's forest industry continue to drive a big chunk of BC's economy. We're part of a sector that's driving climate solutions. We're gonna continue to have a bright future if we can commit to having a balanced discussion about our sector and what it means to BC. So I'm really looking forward to today's discussion and back to you, Anita. 
Thank you so much, Alexa. And now please help me welcome Stuart Muir, Executive Director of ResourceWorks. Stuart, over to you. Thank you, Anita. And thanks, Alexa, for that excellent introduction uh, to the sector. Um, I, I think forestry is front of mind for a lot of people right now because of the, the fact of the essential industry through the pandemic, those jobs have kept producing benefits in all these communities that Alexa has discussed, kept the economic engine going for British Columbia. And it's also an important part for the whole rural economy that is uh, what we all depend on. I'm just gonna flip over to share my screen so that you can see a little presentation I've got. Uh, one thing Alexa mentioned was the balance between the economy and the environment. And this is just so important. I wanna tell you about ResourceWorks briefly. We're a public interest research group, a not-for-profit based in Vancouver, been around for eight years. We look at the natural resource sector, generally speaking. And uh, today, of course, we're talking about forestry. And um, I, I just wanna give you a, a high level view of, of the BC economy. This is our export profile. And if you look at where the red arrows are, on the left, forest product manufacturing, and on the right, the forestry and logging, one is 31%, one is three, uh, 2%, that's 33%. That's a third of the BC economy in terms of exports that is from forestry. It's an enormous footprint. I would say it's irreplaceable. How would you replace this if you didn't have it? It's an interesting question I can't answer. Um, if you take the overall economy, what economists call the economic base, forestry is 18% of that. Let's call that one fifth. So one fifth of the, the, the BC economy is that. And, and the reasons that Alexa's uh, presentation articulated, I think are why that is. And it's, it's, it's so important. Um, that's the economic side that we see across the province. Here's another way to look at that. Um, this is the local dependence. Some of the areas, um, now you might be thinking Surrey, where Surrey in this, um, Surrey of course is, is uh, the, the shaded area um, on, on your screen there, but the rest of the province, the coloring here shows the degree of dependence on forestry. In some areas around Prince George in the center of the BC map, you can see a percentage dependency on forestry and wood processing that's more than 34%, almost half. Um, other areas, it's a third. It's, it's a huge amount of those local economies. So I think any discussion about forestry in any sense has to include this sense of the, the economic impacts. Um, I'm just gonna move to the sustainability and environmental side, because that's important too. You need to have them in balance, of course. And B, you know, BC is such a sprawling area. It's the size of Texas. Let's just talk about a portion of it. Let's talk about Vancouver Island. So this map here, which my research uh, digital team extracted from the forestry uh, database for the province of British Columbia shows the forested land just on Vancouver Island. And where it's yellow color, that's mountaintops and where people live down the bottom right, that's Victoria. But as you can see, a huge amount of, of forest, healthy forest all around Vancouver Island. Next slide here, sorry, it's a little fuzzy, but it's also drawn from the database. The red is the old growth forest. It's an enormous part of the forest land base. And it's also today in 2021, a huge part of how we have a successful forest industry. There's a great big discussion on this. Um, there's many perspectives. There's a lot of information we have, also a lot of information we need to have. And, and I think there's processes going on that will allow us to have that. But it, I, I wanted to show you this slide just to get a sense of the enormous size of old growth. Sometimes you might hear there's no more old growth left. Well, I'm telling you, this is what the data in the government data banks tells us exists. It's an enormous amount. Um, I just want to look at one thing, OGMA. I don't want to leave you with too many acronyms and, and factoids and statistics here. Just one little thing, though. Uh, um, in, in British Columbia forest practice, there is an, a, a long standing policy to protect old growth that are special because it's a special tree or a special stand of trees. And they've developed a designation called old growth management areas, old OGMA is what I call it here. And that green circle represents the 37,000 Yes, 37,000, you heard it right, old growth management areas outside of parks and things um, that are protected. 
to get a sense of how big that is, there's there's parklands as a, a share of of um, the, the province. Um, if you think of just the old growth management areas, let's take the illustration of Rogers Arena. There's so much uh, old growth, uh, precious trees and, and forest stands tied up in old growth management areas. It's equal to Rogers Arena footprint for every person who resides in BC. It's an enormous amount. Um, if you take parks and old growth management areas together, it's as big as Washington State. It's, it's huge. Let's get back and finish on uh, the, the economy though, because that's kind of what we're talking about today. What are the local impacts? You think 18%, how does that stack up? The stories we're gonna hear today from Jack and from Rob are a kind of local illustration for Surrey of how that uh, impacts the economy. And so I would suggest as you're listening to this, you're, you're, you're thinking about, okay, what are the jobs that Jack and Rob are talking about? Uh, how do these affect the value chain and, and the creation of export value and ultimately, you know, our overall economic base. Um, so those are my thoughts in, in introducing um, our, our speakers and I'm going to throw back to you, Anita. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stuart. And now please help me welcome Jack Gardner. He's a law purchaser and the great grandson of, comp of the company founder of Teal Jones Group right here in Surrey. British Columbia. Jack, over to you. Hey, thank you very much and uh, thanks for having me. So I'm going to talk to you guys about Teal Jones and what we do in the province along with uh, what we do here in Surrey. So Teal Jones was founded by my great-grandfather back in uh, 1946 and over the last 75 years we've grown from a one-man shingle machine to over 2,000 employees here in North America. Now Teal employs over a thousand people here in BC of which half reside and uh, work for us at our main site in Surrey. So our main site in Surrey is located right on the Fraser River, just across from Barnston Island. And we actually have seven separate operations on this site. We have a large log mill, a small log mill, uh, a shingle mill, a planer mill, a groover mill, a panel plant, and a paint facility. Now we've been really fortunate with our uh, workforce that we got here. We actually have second and third generation employees who, you know, their, their mom or dad work for the company, they work for the company now, and now their kids work for the company. And so we've been very lucky with our workforce here. Now, uh, my grandfather and my uncle who currently own Teal have always prioritized the value added production, you know, getting the most value possible from every log. So 100% of that log that runs through our mill is utilized. All the sawdust, all the chips, go towards pulp, paper, biomass manufacturing. And um, we even bail up sawdust for the local nurseries. Everything gets utilized. And uh, one of our customers who purchases our pulp actually helps produce the N95 masks, which you know we all probably used within the last year and a half or so. So uh, one of our biggest challenges owning a mill here in BC has always been uh, a constant log supply. Around 65% of our, our production comes from open market purchases. So trying to find enough fiber to kind of fiber up those mills can be very difficult. And in the last two years, we've invested over $20 million into uh, you know, modernizing our mill to help accommodate a second growth, more readily available log. So not only do we cut lumber, but we also log and hold our own timber licenses and we work very closely with the local First Nations. So most of what we harvest is second growth, but we do cut a modest amount of old growth as it has characteristics needed for many uh, value added um, products such as musical instruments. So this is kind of a unique story about Teal. Um, we're actually the world's largest producer of acoustic guitar tops. And the blocks used for these acoustic guitar tops are actually processed right here at our site in Surrey. And um, anything that we harvest in the woods is act actually processed here in BC. We do not export any logs and we believe in keeping the jobs here in the country. Um, now you've probably seen us on the news lately with the protests with uh, over at Ferry Creek and whatnot. I'd just like to clarify that there's been a lot of misinformation floating around there. Um, it's important to know that we've had a decades long uh, history of responsible forest management and engagement with the local First Nations and our work here on our licenses really represents that. You know, we plant over a million trees a year 
and we really do care about the environment. And, uh, you know, we believe in the balanced approach to the working forest. Now, it's, it's, it's not just about the jobs at the mill. It's about the tugboats bringing the wood up the river. It's about the local saw shop who helps us sharpen our saws. It's about the trucks that haul the lumber out of our yard. And it's even about the, the coffee shop that we stop by in the morning to help wake us up. You know, the, the, the indirect employment, employment from Teal is actually pretty big. Now, Surrey is one of the last cities on the Fraser River with sawmills operating on it. Now, it's very important that we continue to keep these mills running because not only does it provide products that we all rely on, but it also provides great paying jobs that help us feed our families. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jack. And our final presenter th this afternoon is the Vice President Manufacturing and Marketing and co-owner of Sunder Group right here in Surrey is Rob Sunder. Rob, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. Uh, I'm Rob Sunder, Vice President of Manufacturing and Sales. Uh, we are a custom cut company located in Surrey. Uh, we procure logs from BC logging companies and manufacture lumber here at local sawmills like SNR. There's four specialty sawmills at SNR that we run every month um, at three of those sawmills. And uh, uh, we currently process 100,000 cubic meters of logs, creating direct employment to over 100 people, and not counting indirect, just like Jack had mentioned, you know, the tugboat companies, the, the trucking, transportation on the trucking side, rail car, uh, rail car business, uh, um, also container business for export. So, uh, and, and the other thing I, I, I forgot to mention is we also custom cut at Stag Timber, they give us an opportunity to cut at their mill as well. So, um, uh, which is, you know, there's only so many mills that are custom, that we can custom cut at. So we're very concerned about, you know, in the future, if there's, you know, if some of these mills shut down, um, it would be a real problem for us in regards to, you know, because because of the lack of investment in new sawmills or new technology. Uh, our sales are, uh, about $40 million a year in 2019 and 20, of which 40% is sold in the North American market. And the overseas market, we're into Japan, Europe, India, Pakistan, the Middle East. Um, our goal, you know, is to increase, double our sales in the next five years. Um, and, but our challenges, you know, are in regards is, is securing logs log supply, we've applied for category two and got it, but we have to partner up with the logging company to work with us. Uh, category two means that the logging company, like Stephen Teal Jones could go in and, 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 and we win a bid to, to, to log a certain area and we would get what we need for our programs and then they would get some of the wood that they might need for their program. So we're always trying to you know, this is an opportunity for us not to just buy on the open market because most of the logs, all the logs that we buy right now are on the open market and uh, we're focused on local or coastal species, dug fir, hemlock, western red cedar, yellow cedar, um, and also transitioning into second growth. The biggest problem, log exports currently probably over 4 million cubic meters a year, uh, probably set by the government are not favorable in securing those logs for new mills, new investment. So that, that's a major concern for us going forward. Uh, the other thing is our, you know, the current policy set by our current government, uh, you know, not taking industry concerns into consideration. Uh, you know, even the old growth, you know, with the issue with the old growth, we have customers that, that um, purchase old growth lumber for window, like in Europe, we have a big market that we sell into Europe, uh, the Italian market, and they like old growth for, for window products, door products. Uh, so it's a concern, like uh, I believe uh, uh, Stuart mentioned that, you know, there is a lot of old growth on the, co on the coast, on the island. Uh, there's, there's that concern that you know, with all the protesters, uh, you know, 
for example, Teal Jones, we we would we would rely on you know so much cubic meters of old growth logs for our programs. Well, now they're not logging old growth because of all the protests and and concerns there. So that's a concern for us, you know, in regards to you know securing logs for our programs. Um, you know, the other thing is you know that result is no new investment in, in new infrastructure no transition to second growth resulting in more log exports, not less log exports, uh, because people are just not, like I me, mean, Till Jones invested in that second, you know, that, that small log uh, mill that would cut second growth logs. They're one of a few people that are investing in, 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 in the forest industry. Uh, I think uh, my father had mentioned that there's over 140 mill closures, sawmill, plywood plants, shingle mills, added value facilities, in the last 25 to 30 years, you know, we had over 47,000 unionized workers in our province in the mid 80s. Now we're, you know, we're approximately 7,000 unionized workers in the industry. Uh, so, you know, us going, you know, forward, like you say, Surrey is the only mills that are on the river right now. S and R sawmills, will they be around in 10 years? I hope they will be because there's not a lot of options for us. To cut, cut custom cut logs. Uh, you got SNR. We have Halo, Delta sawmills. Mainland is the only mainland and terminal the only mills on the Fraser River that are in Vancouver, and we don't know how long they're going to be around. So, I, again, our concern is is you know going forward, are there going to be mills there to custom cut, or are we just going to be a log export province? Uh, so, thank you, Anita. I just uh, wanted to let you know that uh, that you know we continue to uh, uh, you know rely on 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 you know in regards to forest like logs and and, and hopefully the export the export side of it um, you know the government looks at looks looks at this and 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 changes some policies to, to make it so to, to make our industry successful. Thank you so much, Rob. And panelists, if I can ask you to turn your audio and your camera on, uh, we're going to go to some questions uh, from the audience. Um, but Alexa, I want to start with you first. I want you to speak about the most significant opportunities for the forestry sector. To, and, and what do you see as ensuring that this sector survives? And what if it doesn't? Yeah, I, I'm going to go back to um, my earlier comments and the fact that the world is looking for and demanding products that are a better choice for the planet. And I think we really need to celebrate that BC does resource development, including forestry, really, really well. You know, we're sustainably managing our forests. We have more certified forests than a whole bunch of different uh, countries combined. We have a low carbon advantage. So not only are our products storing carbon for the life of the product. They're also you know, created using less greenhouse gas emissions. That's a really good thing for BC. And so when you're building with wood, when you see the mass timber buildings in all of our communities, including in Surrey at the, at the Guilford Aquatic Center, for instance, this is a building that will store carbon for its lifetime. And it doesn't stop there. You're also seeing you know, governments, citizens, looking to displace single-use plastics. What better product than fiber from our forests, sustainably managed forests? And so, I mean, I think when you're thinking about a, a, a industry that has been foundational to the economy, that supports so many jobs, with young people thinking about things like the climate as something that they care about, we should be championing young people looking to get into a sector that can be part of the solution. And so, I mean, I think um, overall, with respect to your question about how do we get there, um, it's really about working together. It's working in partnership with government, First Nations, labor, you name it, to think about the policies, the pathways, the partnership that are going to make that possible. Jack and Rob, uh, first, Jack, I wanted to get your perspective on uh, you know, Surrey's development and construction sector is thriving. Uh, it really helped us during this pandemic in terms of economic survival. 
and uh, supporting families. How important are your operations to Surrey's construction companies? And, and what share of Surrey's uh, construction industry do local sawmills feed? Jack. So I would say we're pretty important to the local uh, economy here. And as like to put a number on shares, I, I don't think I could you know, even come up with that number, but we do sell to a lot of local um, distribution yards here. And especially on our cedar end of things, like um, we do sell locally here quite a bit. So I, I would say it is pretty important, but to put a number on it, I, I honestly, I honestly have no, no clue. Rob, what's um, your perspective? A lot of our lumber that we produce here is sold to secondary manufacturers in, in Surrey. There's, there's like uh, HMS, Calpor that, that dries wood for us. So they, they create employment. We sell to, to a place uh, called uh, um, uh, Central Cedar, which is just in Langley. Uh, so yeah, we, between Surrey and Langley, we sell to secondary manufacturers and also distribution yards like uh, uh, Canwell, uh, Taiga. So yeah, we definitely, um, I think maybe 15, 20% of our product goes to, to the local to the local secondary manufacturers, which creates jobs, dry kiln jobs and, and reman added value jobs. Uh, yeah, so that's where I'm at on that. Stuart, I want you to speak about uh, the paper that uh, we were a part of uh, the Surrey Board of Trade, but it was a national coalition, a task force of recommendations to support a variety of resource industries. And, and many of the recommendations were meant to instigate change provincially and federally. Can you speak to some of those advocacy pieces that need to happen to ensure the survival of the forestry industry? Yeah, thank you, Anita. The, the work we did nationally during the pandemic was about building back in a, in a stronger way so that we have uh, jobs that contribute to this very significant one-fifth of the economy that is forestry in BC. I think huge future for the carbon economy and forestry in BC. For example, I don't know if everyone knows this, but uh, younger trees as they grow and grow quickly, uh, suck up a lot of carbon from the atmosphere. And as they go through those early sprint growth phases, they are incredibly effective in that. Whereas older forests, once they become static, they're not locking up more carbon, they slow down. So it's, it's very important to have a mix. There's been recent studies, we wrote about one out of uh, University of Denmark recently that showed once again, the, the overwhelming evidence that um, a healthy growing forest, and that, that is part of forest renewal. So when we have these forests turning over and uh, active forestry is part of that, you've got the seeds of a, not just a, an economic benefit, but the environmental side and the climate side, which is of course, increasingly important, you've got that covered. And just to, to kind of a footnote to that, you know, sometimes people ask, uh, um, well, why, why don't we just have a second growth industry? We just work with the second growth trees. And over time, everyone in forestry tells me that that's where we're moving to. Why can't we do that tomorrow though? It's, it's actually kind of simple because we don't have enough forest that is second growth that would support that 20% of the, that one fifth of the BC economy. Um, we need the old growth to balance out the supply so that we've got not only, you know, very special logs that have their own characteristics, but also the, the, the supply because the volume of old growth and bear in mind that every 20 seconds on Vancouver Island, a tree enters old growth. It, it, it has its 250th birthday, which makes it old growth. Every, every 20 seconds, three per minute, um, you know, there's so much old growth volume there that uh, if you think about... Uh, an investment, maybe you've got some bonds and you're clipping your coupons on your bonds to, to, to live off. Um, the, the, the forest industry in BC is a little like, like that because the, the growth on an annual basis in the size of trees and the volume of, of the, the woods is, is enough to support all of the mills and forest activity. It's a wonderful balance. And as long as we have that sustained and balanced over time, we're going to have a healthy, sustainable industry. 
Alexa, what do you say to critics that say, oh, when we're talking about building uh, homes or building uh, towers uh, from a commercial perspective, that they should be concrete steel, uh, not really wood-based? Well, what do you say to those people? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, it's back to the, to the fact that, you know, you, you, you like on the, on, on the, the very most basic level, you're sustainably harvesting the product and for every tree that's harvested, three are replanted. So you've got this renewable, recyclable um, resource that then goes into a product that stores carbon for its lifetime. It's taking greenhouse gas emissions out of the atmosphere. And, and why wouldn't that be a good thing? It, it's a better choice for the planet. And you're seeing jurisdictions around the world looking for more of it because they're seeing the climate benefits. There's also been a ton of studies done as you know, as you know, developers and, and cities were looking at um, really leveraging the opportunity and making buildings taller, that not only is it good for the climate, it's safe, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's soundproof. There's been so much innovation done to make it the product of choice that you know, we're seeing you know, exponential growth you know, around the world and BC can be a leader. It can be the center of excellence, not just from a products perspective, but for exporting skills and know-how and how to do it well. Jack, uh, can you speak to, um, you know, supply is such an issue related to housing affordability and, and that's what's really driving our property taxes, one of the elements uh, of those, uh, you know, property tax bills that we just recently received. Uh, do you think that logs should be more, made more available for local housing instead of exporting the logs to international markets or the US? Uh, what's your perspective on that? So I obviously got a little bit different perspective here just because we like to, uh, you know, we have local mills here. We like to employ everyone locally. We don't export logs. So, uh, yeah, like it should be more readily available to local manufacturers. You know what? Like it, it is tough. And that was one of my uh, challenges I spoke about was, you know, that's probably the toughest thing about operating here in BC is just finding enough fiber supply. So I think there should be, uh, you know, right now they got kind of something called the export list. So if you want to advertise, or if you want to export logs out of BC, you have to advertise it on a list. And if you're a domestic uh, manufacturer, you're allowed to look at that list and uh, make an offer on those logs before going out. And if your offer gets accepted, uh, those, those logs are actually, uh, they call it blocked from exiting the province. But that doesn't mean that that company has to sell to you. So maybe if there was some type of, you know, better rule with, you know, offering on this export and then getting the logs into our um, mill or other, you know, local manufacturers, maybe, you know, we'd see a lot more volume there and keeping those, we, we really keep those logs here domestically. So you know, it's important that they do, they do kind of stay around here. Rob, do you have a perspective on that too? So Stuart, uh, I don't know if you can address this question um, or even Alexa, there was, there was an agreement on a two year deferral in the Ferry Creek area. Other First Nations have asked for deferrals. How will this decision and other potential deferrals impact the logs your facilities need to operate? Stuart, do you have a perspective on that? Yes, and I'll, I'll leave it to Jack and Rob to address what it means for their facilities. But I think from the point of view of the deferrals, we're going through a phase right now. You remember in November of 2019, BC made history by bringing the UNDRIP, uh, United, Na United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, into BC law. And forestry is one of the areas, given the fact that uh, British Columbia's 206 First Nations are mainly rural based and they're on the forest land base. Uh, it's an opportunity for First Nations to, uh, you know, find an economic reconciliation path. And I think it's really important when you look at the Pachita First Nation, if we're talking about that two-year deferral, where they said, hey, look, uh, we, we see that uh, there's some uh, strategy, economic strategy questions that we need to look at, some resource strategy questions. We need a little bit of time to do that. 
and they've asked for um, that time. It's been it's been granted, and they're working on that. I think in other areas, uh, other First Nations are going through this. You see the Huayat uh, First Nation; they've become a significant partner with industry. This is on Vancouver Island. I'm speaking of. Um, but it's replicated all across the province where First Nations are realizing, hey, we're, we're now able to negotiate and find uh, a more significant part of the economy as true partners. And, you know, when, when we see the, the tragedy in Kamloops and, and other news out of Saskatchewan, you, you realize, I mean, deep down in our hearts that uh, what, what is it that uh, will allow that economic reconciliation and other reconciliation to take place? Well, surely it, uh, part of that is to have the same access to economic opportunity as all Canadians. And forestry is one of the best ways that so many First Nations can acquire that. So when, when they need a little bit of time to figure it out, I, I think that's a good thing because they're doing that work. And at the end of the day, I'm actually really confident that all British Columbia residents will benefit from the success of First Nations residents. Uh, Rob, do you have a perspective on that as well? In regards to uh, the Ferry Creek, uh, I, I, I mean, my biggest issue is again, like I said, I would be getting logs from 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 Teal Jones if they were logging Ferry Creek for my programs, and by law they should be able to log based on you know what happened. But th so th this is our concern. I would rely on probably 10,000 meters a year of old growth logs from, from Teal Jones for my program. And right now, this year, I've got zero. So that's a concern for us, for sure. You know, we've got customers in Europe, especially Italy, Germany, that buy old growth that, that, that we run programs for. We, we cut the logs. We actually dry the wood here. We, we, we do everything here and sell it as a finished, you know, a product that goes over there dried and, and custom cut. So uh, our old, my, again, my concern is I cut at Halo Sawmills in, in Pitt Meadows, and we usually cut about 30, 36,000 meters a year of old growth fir in that mill. I'm struggling to cut month to month right now because of the lack of old growth logging. Alexa, why are there not enough areas of second growth? And what can we do to improve that? No, I actually just want to uh, piggyback on, on the last question. Because I'm not going to comment specifically on, you know, what's happening on the ground and, and, and the companies can do that. Um, but I do think we need to take a step back and, and Kofi has been a huge proponent of the need to look at the future of BC forest with balance. And so if you think about British Columbia, and again, in terms of something BC does really well, over 50% of the land base in BC is currently protected or under some form of conservation designation. And we fully support that, and that's a great thing. But we also support the forests for the economic value, the good jobs for British Columbians, the support for communities that it brings. And so what we really need to do as a province, and that's collectively, it's government, it's First Nations, it's companies, it's labor unions working together to actually outline a vision that clearly describes how we're going to achieve all of those objectives and what the parameters around that look like so that we can achieve certainty. And that has to be really based in facts. It has to be done with everyone at the table. And it's not a question about, you know, one or the other. It's actually about healthy forests, climate solutions and jobs and healthy communities. And that's a win-win for all British Columbians. And so I think we all need to take a step back sometimes and think about the picture and how we can achieve all of those things that we care about. Jack, um, can you talk about what have you learned during the pandemic? Uh, how, you know, how have you modified your operations and, and what do you need for your workforce into the future uh, in this post-pandemic economic recovery that we're entering? Well, what I learned was, uh, you know, forestry was deemed an essential service. So I felt pretty bad for all those companies that shut down during, you know, the first wave of little COVID there and, uh, you know, all the restaurant workers and what else, but we continued to run and we adjusted and, you know, we took every safe measure into place and, um, you know, post pandemic economy, 
we just hope, um, you know, things stay high. You know, it's great that the lumber market's doing well right now. It helps a lot of people out. And um, yeah. Rob, can you speak about, uh, your dad uh, spoke to me recently about the innovation, the international connection with India. And yep. as many know that uh, uh, 30% of Surrey's population is of South Asian origin, but the innovation that your dad, your family have done in that uh, connection with India, uh, can you speak about that as it relates to your industry? It's 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 a challenge. I mean, for us, like I mean, we we got involved in India in the early two thousands, and uh, they've got forced initiatives over there. They have offices over there. They're promoting the product. We our biggest problem is getting product into the market at the right price. When the U.S. market does really well, it hurts. You know, with with transportation into India, uh, it hurts. Uh, hurts our ability to grow the business right so uh but again we're making inroads where we're, we're we're moving coastal yellow cedar we're moving coastal red cedar hemlock and douglas fir would we like to do more yes uh it's a price thing right now um logistics transportation is an issue we also have a relationship with uh, with warehouser uh, where we're moving their southern yellow pine lumber and logs. We're the exclusive agent for them and we're building up, but that's all U.S. related, right? So most of that stuff's coming out of the U.S., but we are definitely making inroads into the Indian market and not everybody wanted to get into that market because it's, you know, I mean, it's not like China and Taiwan where things, you know, the volume, it's a volume thing in those markets, whereas this is, India is more of a consumer, so they'll take what we set, send to them in yellow cedar or Douglas fir is for, for again, windows and doors and like specialty stuff, not construction, like not construction material for, for building houses and that, but more in, um, interior stuff like flooring, kitchen cabinets, you know, you know, wall, you know, that type of stuff. It's, it's all added value that we do to that market like we'll sell shop industrial shop that they chop finger joint uh we'll sell clear you know clear yellow cedar that the same thing that they'll they'll use for mostly interior finishing and sometimes exterior furniture especially with yellow cedar and red cedar alexa what is your perspective uh, under a new u.s president and the softwood lumber agreement are we going to get the agreement that we need to move this sector forward yeah well um again just taking a, a step back i mean i think the the administration brings a whole bunch of new opportunities of course the 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 us is our biggest trading partner and you know what's really important right now is that the biden administration has a significant infrastructure uh, agenda and it has a significant climate agenda. And so back to my earlier point, I think there's two advantages there that, that we can be um, front and, and center for in terms of being the partner of choice. You know, do I, do I think that the industry would love to see a soft lumber uh, resolution? Uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, the, the whole debate around subsidies continues to be completely unjustified. And so we would like to see resolution uh, however, that involves both sides coming to the table. And while we're hopeful that the, the US side comes to the table, they have not yet uh, done that. And that's at the expense of the US consumer, you know, back to why markets are, why they are the way they are today and, and prices so high. One of the biggest kind of demand stories of the last year has been the fact that in America, you had a demographic between the age of you know, 25 and 35 looking to enter into the house market with you know, a record under supply situation. And so with the, the US producers unable to meet that demand, which they haven't been able to do for a very long time, BC continues to be, step in, continues to be able to step in and, and fill that gap. And so not only is it would it be a good thing for the Canadian side in terms of finding resolution to this so that we can put dollars that are now being spent uh, on duties back into investment, back into innovation, back into job creation, 
it would also be good for the U.S. consumer who are who are desperately looking uh, to, to to buy a new home uh, and have that be affordable. Stuart, you mentioned this a little bit uh, in your presentation, but I want you to give the audience a picture of how this industry intersects with other businesses, uh, other industries. Uh, you know, what is that correlation? And if this forestry industry sector uh, is not sustainably supported by government policy, et cetera, uh, you know, other businesses are also at risk. What do you think? Yeah, very interesting question. Thanks, Anita. One thing that's happened over the decades is that the BC forest industry of today has become a, a very different one than in yesteryear. There has been investment, capital investment in automation, just like in every other aspect of our lives uh, that has uh, made capital more uh, effective and productive. And it's also shifted where the workforce is. I mean, the old days of the, you know, the mass workforce with the lunch buckets, I mean, that's definitely still there, people who go to work on the sort of the front lines to produce the product. But what's different today is that it's much more marketing business and much more based on the sort of mental work, the, the intellectual work added towards upgrading and getting the greatest amount of value out of all of our forest products. And, and I think there's been a shift uh, even though the, uh, I think some of the economic methods we have to understand it aren't uh, uh, as updated as they need to be, uh, we've seen that. I mean, so more people working in offices and, and, and into the regional centers. And I think Surrey, um, you know, if, if it's assumed that there's a trend over time away from the natural resource sector, actually everything we found in the last several years of our, of our independent research at ResourceWorks is the opposite. We're becoming actually more. I mean, the world is not stopping using fibers and wood products. It's not stopping to use uh, using minerals and metals. There's more people using more things. And we have to make sure that's done sustainably. And then BC is really a global beacon of good practice and high environmental standards. Everyone in BC, if you ask them in a poll, they'll tell you they're an environmentalist. We all are environmentalists and we all want to make sure we're doing things right. And so we're in this enviable position where we've had a modernized industry. Yes, it's been challenged to get modern, but now that we've done that, it's something really, really precious. And I think it, it's it's going to be super important that uh, you know we we have a balanced view in government in making decisions that recognize where that value is, where the jobs are created. Um, you know, when you when you look at Surrey, we're you know we're hearing from from the the producers of forest products, but those producers they all have accountants and they have lawyers and they have marketing firms and sales divisions. They have international relationships, and and uh, you know this this runs through the the Metro Vancouver area. So in that sense, uh, you know every, every every municipality of the 2023 um, Metro Vancouver municipalities is a forest community, and uh, you might not see it the same way we used to, but it's there. Jack, uh, how is taxation affecting your business right now? In the form of property tax or? Or any form of taxation. We're being hit from all fronts, so, so to speak. Well, I'd say the biggest tax would kind of be that uh, softwood lumber agreement kind of tax, if you want to call it like that. Um, in November, they're going to be raising it up to 20%. So that's really going to affect not just us, but our customers when we ship lumber down to the States. A lot of business that we do is down to, into the States in the Midwest. So I'd say it's a huge impact on us. And um, moving forward, I think we or I hope that we can you know, settle something on that side. As for property tax and stuff like that, rising property taxes obviously hurt us. You know, we're just trying to employ people here, do a good job and um, make products that we all rely on. So when you got kind of more expenses like that coming at us, it obviously does hurt us to a point. Rob, what about you? From a Well, rising taxes to, you know, sawmills like, like, Stag Timber Till Jones or SNR sawmills in Surrey, um, our rates have gone up. Like our cutting rates have gone up. Like we hire sawmills to cut. So uh, I think it, it does affect us too. It, it, you know, all costs that go to the sawmills or, or where we, you know, what we cut is going to affect us. And, and, it, and we've seen that. And they've said it's because of this, this, and this that we have to raise rates. So, yes, it does affect us. Alexa from the Council of Forest Industries, also known as COFI, uh, what are your closing remarks in terms of 
what you want to see into the future of this for this sector? Um, I'll keep it short, and I think it's what I'd like to leave the audience with, and and that is that the BC forest sector remains foundational to communities and to economies overall, but also in urban centers like Surrey. We do resource development, including forestry, really, really well in BC, and we need to be proud of that. And we need to be looking at opportunities to leverage it as our competitive advantage, not only from a products and market side of things, but how we export our know-how and our talent with respect to our sustainability practices. So I would just I I, I would just want to leave um, the audience with those with that for thought. Stuart, your closing remarks. Uh, a final thing that I think didn't come up too much, but I think it's worth saying. Uh, Alexa mentioned it. It's the impact on provincial services delivered to citizens at that base level of personal well-being, be that education or transportation, how we get around, or our ability to access uh, mass transit so that we can get around in a, in a cleaner way. All that costs money, schools cost money. And forestry, like uh, no other industry that we have in BC, produces the revenues to do that. So it's very much in the interest of everyone at the policy making table to make sure we're, we're preserving the economic benefits, making sure the environmental balance is there, and not being, you know, sort of pushed and pressured into decisions that that will inevitably uh, uh, ca cause us to look elsewhere for revenues and discover that they're not there to be had. Rob, your closing remarks. I I basically think that the government has to to take into consideration and do a better job in in in, um, in the concerns of the industry. Uh, and uh, you know, to make it a prosperous industry, I think the government again has to. There's just some policies that need to be changed to protect, to protect the saw the people that invest in sawmills and people like ourselves that are the, that are relying on log supply to run our business. Yes. Thank you, Jack. Yeah, I kind of agree with Rob a bit there. BC is kind of a tough place to do business. Now you got some of the best forests in the world, the best managed forests in the world. And yet every year, us being a sawmill, we do take downtime because we can't find enough logs. And these guys go on, you know, EI or whatever, and they don't get to work. So, you know, it, it's just sometimes tough. So I, I agree with Rob a little bit and uh, having the government kind of support us a little bit more with uh, the industry and our concerns. Well, thank you so much to all of you for providing your perspective on this integral industry, not only to Surrey, but to British Columbia and to Canada. And uh, Kofi is here for the industry, as is ResourceWorks, as is the Surrey Board of Trade. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us. And thank you to the Council of Forest Industries for supporting this uh, event. And uh, we have many more events coming up uh, into the summer. So I encourage you to look at businessinsurrey.com. On July 14th, we're hosting Canada's finance critic, Ed Fast. July 15th, BC Green Party leader, Sonia Forstino. And July 16th, BC's Minister of Agriculture, Lana Popham. Ladies and gentlemen, I know it's a challenging time for us, uh, but I ask you to make it a great business day.